Well, uh, as I said last week, um, we're doing things a little bit different because of the time constraints. And sure enough, last week I almost went too long. And I don't want to do that today. So we're going to open in prayer and then dive right into our uh, lesson. And uh, so while we pray, pray for me. This uh, lesson uh, is Jesus on marriage and divorce. Father, we come before you this morning uh, with grateful hearts that we serve a risen Savior. Jesus is alive today. Uh, he walks amongst us. His Spirit indwells us. You are in control of the universe. You're in control of every uh, tiny detail of our lives, uh, the, both what we consider the bad and the good and we rejoice in that. And Father, our hearts really are full uh, on this Lord's Day of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for uh, this church, and what a blessing uh, your work here has been to all of us. Uh, you've been good to us. Uh, and there's so many other expressions of your love for us and kindness, um, and we thank you uh, both spiritually and materially. Uh, but Father, we also know that there are sorrows and afflictions that are taking place within our body, certainly within the world, and we offer our petition to you that you give blessing, mercy, uh, understanding, patience uh, to those that are, to all of us who, are, who have trials in our lives. That, that you would hear our prayer and answer in an abundance of grace. Lord, we pray for your protection of our globe, of our earth. Uh, we pray for wisdom, for authorities, uh, and for a, a vaccine, uh, and, and that you would protect uh, those in our body, especially who are, are sick, protect us from getting more sick, uh, protect, uh, um, and we pray for the coming elections. We pray as we're, you've instructed us to pray for those in authority over us. We ask that you'd give us uh, wise and good rulers. And now, Lord, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount again, we pray that you would give us understanding, uh, that you would give us truth, and that uh, you would bless us with the ministry of your Spirit to to understand these things. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in our study uh, on the Sermon of the Ma Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, we have uh, entered into that section in which our Lord uh, explains the meaning of the Mosaic Law as it pertained to the people of his day. It was an important topic and an essential one because the Jewish religious leaders of the day had largely misinterpreted and abused its meaning for their own purposes. But in this section, we find Jesus reestablishing its true meaning. Uh, the law was intended to provide a window into the righteousness of God so that God's people might align their own conduct and attitudes into his righteousness which was far different than the contaminated version the scribes and Pharisees had crafted. The Lord underlined the critical nature of his teaching with his somewhat startling introduction to it in the 20th verse of Matthew chapter 5. I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That was a bold statement, but the righteousness that Jesus espoused was not one of obedience to man-made rules, but a righteousness of the heart. And we emphasized that in our last lesson. That was God's intent when he gave them the law, and now the Lord expounds its true meaning. We've mentioned the formula he employed. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. In other words, here is the perversion that you have been taught now Hear the mind of God. In our last lesson, we examined what Jesus had to say about adultery, 
which in turn led him to underscore the importance of personal purity. And that discussion leads naturally to the question of divorce. Now you'll notice, please, the, the brunt of this larger section concerns itself with certain commands given by God. But God did not, in his law, command divorce. Divorce was something, rather, that was permitted under a specific circumstance. It was given to provide protection for a woman who had been dismissed by her husband, especially in capricious and unfair circumstances, so that it was made clear to all that their marriage was no longer in effect and the woman was free to remarry. The law in Deuteronomy 24 made provision for a husband to divorce his wife in the event he found some, quote, indecency in her. And it was that little clause that led to debate over its meaning. What actually constituted an indecency that might justify divorce? In Jesus' day, uh, the debate largely centered on the opposing interpretations of the two famous rabbinical camps, uh, that of Rabbi Hillel and that of the school of Shammai. The school of Shammai took the harder line and insisted this indecency must meet the level of adultery, while Hillel allowed a much more liberal interpretation, going so far as justifying divorce for only the slightest dissatisfactions, such as merely burning dinner. I've burned a few chickens on the grill before, and I think it's a forgivable <laughs> offense. And I've learned from someone I love and who's close to me that there's a little trick. You can turn it over so that the good side is up and the burnt <laughs> side is down. Love you, honey. <laughs> Where was I? Against this background, Jesus offered his straightforward understanding of the solemnity of marriage in the eyes of God, its permanent nature, and the very limited concession for divorce expressed in his so-called exception clause. It's found in our passage in the sermon, uh, translated in my New American Standard Version as except for the reason of unchastity in verse 32. But at the start, let's read, we're going to read three pertinent passages. Some of you don't have an outline, but you'll see there if you do, uh, there's three passages we're going to read, uh, and I'll be making reference to each in our lesson. First, Deuteronomy chapter 24, uh, beginning in verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. And she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, is not allowed to take her again to be his wife, since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. And then the next passage is the one from our sermon in Matthew chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 31. It was said, this is Jesus speaking, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now the natural question arises when you read verse 32, how, how does that make her commit adultery, 
And I, I'm one of those that writes in the margin of my Bible that's an anathema to some of you, but I have a note when Dan was teaching this passage, and I think he's right, uh, what that meant was something like, like it causes her to be stigmatized as an adulterer. Um, the fact that he had dismissed her causes her to be stigmatized as an adulterer. And to underscore how seriously the Lord uh, looked upon the sanctity of marriage in situations where a man has put away or divorced uh, his wife for reasons other than adultery, he insists that if the woman remarries or if another man marries her, that union is in the eyes of God an adulterous union. And then uh, more in uh, Matthew 19. Please turn there. Matthew 19, beginning in verse 3. Here come the Pharisees testing the Lord. They came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. I read an article in uh, the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago. Actually, by now, it was a few months ago. Uh, I wish I had saved it. Uh, this article reported on the striking decline in the numbers of couples getting married in the United States. In the last year, uh, fewer people got married as a percentage since records have been kept. Why is that? You may quibble with my answers, uh, but I suspect all of us here would point to similar factors. Uh, the undermining of a general moral order in our society and a stark increase in sexual permissiveness, uh, growing out of the wide pervasiveness of relativism in our social construct, relativism in our ethics, uh, but also in our understanding of truth. There's nothing new about me saying that. Uh, then there's the demonstrable increase in materialism and selfishness. And most people understand innately that a serious marriage cannot easily abide too much of either of those. Uh, add to that a selfish fear of commitment and an understandable fear of the consequences of bad marriages that litter our landscape. And it's somewhat understandable that many today are loath to dive in to such a relationship. The divorce rate is higher than it has ever been, a, a consequence of the debasement of marriage, certainly, but also of the increase in secular humanism that offers no restraint against the free exercise of flimsy commitments, but instead elevates temporary unions dependent upon self-seeking, self-fulfillment. I hope I didn't sound mad as I went through that, but I don't like it. Uh, consequently, uh, divorce touches almost all of us. Uh, family, close friends, fellow members of our body, I would imagine, uh, starting from this spot right here where I stand and radiating uh, out. Uh, there are none here who have not felt personally the pain 
of divorce. Admitting that, it makes the prospect of addressing it less daunting. So we want to understand God's perspective on divorce, and particularly his son Jesus' teaching on it, because here we see Jesus' view of it. And if you will allow me to offer up a big idea for our lesson today, it is that Jesus' concern was not so much the exception clause or what might be legitimate circumstances that could lead to divorce, but God's intention that marriage be a permanent institution. His whole emphasis in debating with the rabbis, John Stott noted in his commentary, was positive, namely on God's original institution of marriage as an exclusive and permanent relationship of God's yoking of two people into a union which man must not break. It appears that for Jesus, even in cases of immorality, divorce wasn't to be construed as the ideal outcome, but instead a reluctant concession. So I know it's a difficult uh, topic, uh, but one that we need to confront. Well, I borrowed an outline uh, from Martin Lloyd-Jones. It gives us an orderly way of understanding all three passages. Uh, What the first, what the law of Moses really taught about divorce. Secondly, what the scribes and Pharisees taught. And thirdly, what Jesus taught. But first, what the law of Moses really taught about divorce. And when we examine back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, when we examine these four short verses in that chapter, the first thing we should note is the purpose of it being brought up in uh, the first place. There's only one command given there, and it does not concern reasons or conditions for a man to divorce his wife. And by the way, I probably don't need to say this, but there was no such thing as a woman divorcing her husband, for women did not have the same social standing as men did. They had very few rights. And that factor alone suggests a part of the background for why the subject is addressed here. It's to protect women who found themselves in this situation. But no command is given here for a man to divorce his wife. It rather addresses a contingent kind of situation with many if contingencies required in order to arrive at a divorce. That's the force of it. Follow me here. If a man has taken a wife by marrying her, and then if it happens that he finds some indecency in her, and if he gives her this certificate of divorce and formally sends her away in a divorce proceeding, and then if she remarries, and if the second husband either dies or divorces her, then her first husband is not allowed to take her again as his wife. There is the one command. The purpose of the paragraph is to prevent remarriage to an ex-wife. Why that would be the case is not exactly made clear. Uh, Perhaps it was to reinforce the so-called indecency of the cause of the first divorce. Uh, More likely, though, it was because the woman's second marriage, though not considered to be an adulterous union, nevertheless constituted the definitive end of the first marriage. Nothing is said, you'll notice, about a circumstance in which the divorced wife has not remarried but then is reunited with her first husband. Uh, The woman has not been defiled in that sense from the original marriage to her husband, but once she has married again, then God would have all involved to understand that marriage is sacred. The two have become one flesh, and there's to be no back and forth for such a God-ordained institution. Then what did Moses teach in regard to divorce. Well, the passage itself addresses a contingent situation and offers divorce as a concession to the situation 
and not a command, as the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day had contorted it to their own advantage. The certificate itself was an instrument intended to protect the woman, uh, since it was understood in the ancient world that she would by necessity remarry. Uh, no other scenario could be contemplated. The certificate vouched that her first marriage had ended and she was free to remarry. There's a good summary in Matthew 19, so I'll ask you to turn back now to Matthew 19 where my Bible is open. To the Pharisees' skewed question in verse 7. Why did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce? Jesus replied, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. This is what we mean when we say it was a concession, a concession to the sinfulness of all of us, of men and women. And the Lord goes on to the, remind them in verse 8 that from the beginning it has not been this way. Marriage was intended to be sacred and inviolable. But over the years, and especially by the time of the first century, Jewish men had learned to abuse the contingent allowance of the law and create for themselves a system where any flimsy excuse could be made to separate from his wife and from, from their marriage. I mentioned the two rabbinical schools of Hillel and Shammai. These represented the competing perspectives of Jesus' day, and Jesus can be said in a way to have sided with Shammai, who had taken this more rigorous view of the rights to divorce, insisting it could only be undertaken for a severe offense, as Jesus put it in verse 9, for immorality or fornication about which more in just a moment. But against that teaching was the more lax view of the school of Hillel, which argued that the ground for divorce only needed to be some, quote, unseemly thing, uh, widely interpreted by the husbands to include a wife's most trivial shortcomings in his eyes only. For example, if she was simply no longer of interest to, to him. You know, much like today, when a man may just claim that he and his wife have somehow grown apart, and he has just decided to go young because his wife has become unattractive to him, and so that makes her unseemly in his eyes. So Moses' concession in Deuteronomy chapter 24 was meant to control the circumstances in which, under which a man could put his wife away. He narrows it down, back to that passage, to a circumstance when the husband has found some indecency in his wife. It was by no means a command to divorce, but a limitation on remarriage in the event of a divorce. And as to the indecency itself, we can't be certain of what uh, that was. It could not have been adultery, think, uh, for the consequence of adultery at the time the law was given was death, not, not the dissolution of the marriage. But it had to have been something exceptional to merit the action allowed in response. John Murray, the great Westminster Seminary theologian and professor of the mid-20th century, I mentioned him last week uh, on a totally unrelated topic on reconciliation Today I'm quoting him on a divorce, but Murray, that's because Murray wrote what I believe is the definitive exegetical study on the subject of divorce. It's entitled simply Divorce. And in it, Murray can only posit that the indecency must have been some kind of impropriety, perhaps in the category of defect or omission. It could not have been adultery per se, but some kind of shameful conduct connected with the sex life. Or it may have been some other kind of serious impropriety worthy of censure on the part of the husband. So I was quoting Murray there. And the legislation was provided to allow for the divorce, but to make clear that she had not committed 
adultery. So far from granting husbands an array of prejudices to justify leaving their wives, it greatly limited their rights, underscoring the sanctity of the divine institution of marriage. But we find in this Matthew 19 passage clues to what the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day themselves taught about divorce. So the second topic in our outline. First, in verse 3, there was the issue itself and the debate that separated the two parties. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And then in verse 7, the way they formulated the question, or rather skewed the question, why did Moses command to give her this certificate of divorce? These guys were crafty. Uh, they had learned to frame their questions about divorce against the background of their own sinful inclinations. We might say even against the background of their own settled worldview, ignoring what was the heart of the issue, and instead focusing on the small detail, which was the certificate uh, Moses had provided as a mere concession to their sinful proclivities. They were evading the real question and moving the, oh yeah, this is what people do, moving the argument, argument to more friendly grounds and away from an issue in which they were more vulnerable. We call it typically a red herring argument because it is designed to distract from the real target and move the inquiry along an entirely different scent, S-C-E-N-T, in an entirely different scent. But by this time, it's doubtful they were even aware of the ruse. So implanted was the distracting lie that had permeated their social order. They had lost their trail a long time previous. But Jesus sliced through their selfish and sham preoccupation with divorce. Jesus was good at slicing through. And he zeroed in on the more fundamental and foundational premise, which was the divine origin of marriage. He pointed them back to the scriptures all the way back to the book of Genesis and the creation account. Have you not read? He asked. It's the age-old failure. They had not read God's pronouncement on the issue, and if they had, they had chosen to ignore it because they didn't like what it said. Here is the answer, uh, not just to marriage and divorce, but to every other vexing problem that plagues society. It is the answer to the issues that divide our nation today. I punish myself every Sunday morning before I come here to, by watching Meet the Press. <laughs> but here's the answer to all those issues that divide our nation today. What does God say? What has he said? And our prayer, I know it's your prayer as well as mine, is that God will not allow his people to get so far off the scent that we bolt in every wrong direction that catches the nose of the unbelieving world. So what did Jesus teach about marriage and divorce? Well, we've already an idea from what we've just said. His view found its origin in the mind of God, found in the Word of God, and thus reflecting the divine design for marriage in the first place. In answer to the Pharisees' probing question, Jesus goes back to the very beginning of God's ordaining of the institution of marriage. Twice, in the Matthew 19 passage, he makes reference to the beginning. Verse 4, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And again in verse 8, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, 
it has not been this way. And in other words, Jesus would have them go back to first principles rather than conjure up trickery in order to pursue their selfishness. From the beginning, God had given to mankind the gift of marriage for the highest of purposes. It is a divine institution and therefore a sacred one. Uh, just as he had stamped upon the individual the sanctity of divine creation, which is what he had done when he created Adam, so he had imprinted upon marriage the sanctity of two individuals becoming one flesh, meaning that what God had joined together, no man should separate. So from the beginning, the idea of divorce was completely at odds with the divine design. And by the time man's underhandedness had conceived of the once inconceivable and begun the practice of divorce, God made his position known in the strongest of terms, I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Malachi 2.16. When you look at it that way, which was the way Jesus looked at it, it seems obvious that if Moses permitted divorce for some gross uncleanness, it was an exception that found its source, not in God's original design, but in man's hard, sinful heart. The business that I'm in, the, the, my career, is buttressed by a foundation of contracts. There's far more to it than contracts, but it advances through the, the mechanism of contracts. And I know it's the same for other businesses as well. There was once a time when I thought that I might, could be a lawyer. Uh, perhaps I could, could have become one and become content, but I could never have become a, a real estate attorney. With apologies to some dear friends whose names shall go unmentioned. Negotiating real estate contracts and leases drives me crazy. It is a Byzantine contest of punches and counterpunches orchestrated by year after year of precedent and practice in which the end is almost always a foregone conclusion. And when they're finally done, after a period of time, they inevitably need to be amended or revised in order to accommodate changing circumstances or the passage of time. And the brain is repeated again. Now we're putting pandemic clauses in our contracts. Marriage is not a contract. It is a union. In a sanctified world, it is a spiritual union. Two individuals become one flesh. They are united together and they are kept bound by love for God and love for each other. Marriage was never intended to be a temporary arrangement. It carries no defined term that sets a kind of lapse clause out in the future, allowing one or the other to opt out and go one's separate way. Instead, its boundaries are laid out in the Word of God. God himself not only instituted marriage, but established the ground rules for it. Consequently, as Ben Carson has written in God's word, marriage and love are for the tough-minded. Marriage is commitment. And far from backing out when the going gets rough, marriage partners are to sort out their difficulties in the light of scripture. They are to hang in there improving their relationship, working away at it, precisely because they have vowed before God and man to live together and love each other for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness as in health, until death separates them. Christian Marital love is more than a, an emotional flight of fancy. It is an act of the will. 
a determined commitment to seek the other's good, to cherish, to shelter, to nurture, edify, and show patience with one's partner. Patience. Here is the answer to the sad state of the institution of marriage we highlighted at the beginning of our lesson. It is to return the act of marriage to its God-given place in our culture and view it again as a solemn spiritual exercise to be entered into with joy and faithfulness and a determination to uphold our vows against all threats and temptations. And perhaps ironically, as set in contrast to the false narrative of our surrounding world, that kind of deep-rooted obedience to God himself will inevitably bring with it the kind of tenderness and sentiment that Hollywood typically knows nothing about. With that in mind, here now is a truth from the scriptures, which is again where Jesus derived his teaching on marriage and divorce. Nowhere, nowhere does God command anyone to divorce. That means there are no grounds. No, please listen uh, carefully. That means there are no grounds for anyone to claim that God somehow requires them to divorce. That's not to say that no divorce is ever justified. To say that there are no grounds for one to claim God requires divorce is not the same thing as saying that there may never be grounds for divorce. Jesus, Jesus said it himself more than once, that there could be. But even then, it's to be seen as a continued accommodation to our sinfulness, to the hardness of our hearts. And as we said at the beginning, God did not command divorce. He allowed divorce in limited cases as a concession, not as a desired result. We might say God has tolerated uh, divorce under certain circumstances. But we tend not to think of things that are tolerable in the context of what is intrinsically right or to be desired. No, God allows the dissolution of a marriage only when the union has already been disrupted by the breaking of the command against adultery. And even then, uh, God's word as a whole encourages a law of love and forgiveness that can salvage the rupture by God's grace. In a sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, based on mercy, humility, and reconciliation, that surely is something that ought to be seriously considered. I know that this is a difficult and for many a painful topic. Uh, we live in a broken and sin-filled world. Each one of us, one might think, has enough on our hands uh, making straight our own sinful life, looking in the mirror at ourselves. But then to throw another into the mix, as God in His grace has done with the institution of marriage, the opportunities for calamity are multiplied. Uh, yet that was and is the Lord's wise plan for most of us. God is not some disinterested and distant universal power who has wound up our clock and left us to ourselves. No, he is relational and he has lovingly condescended to have a relationship with us. And in ordaining the institution of marriage, he has gifted us with an intimate relationship on the human level that gives testimony to his own love and devotion to us. In a Christian wedding, we typically hear about that. 
the minister will read from Paul's epistle to the Ephesians and how wives are to be subject to their husbands as Christ is to the church and how husbands are to love their wives sacrificially as Christ loves the church. Uh, the union of a man and a woman into one flesh is a mysterious thing, Paul says, but the mystery is unveiled in knowing that it is a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. But there's another beautiful illustration of God's love in the context of marriage found in the scriptures, and we studied it in the past year. It's the basic premise of the book of Hosea, in which the Lord uses the experience of Hosea with his adulterous wife, Gomer to illustrate the nature of the divine love. If even God himself could exercise such mercy and patience that he would woo back even his own rebellious and adulterous people and reunite them to himself as he directed Hosea to do with Gomer, should we not always when divorce becomes the topic of consideration, seek first, not divorce, but reconciliation that is the hallmark of the greatest love story the world has ever known. Again, I know this is a difficult uh, subject. Uh, we haven't even touched on the issue of desertion. Uh, that is the circumstance the Apostle Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, remember, in which an unbelieving spouse has left or deserted the believing spouse uh, there after strongly asserting that in the situation of a mixed marriage like that, a believer and unbeliever, the believing spouse must not divorce the unbelieving spouse uh, Paul goes on to support the idea of a believing spouse simply letting the other one leave in the case of such desertion, asserting that the brother or sister in Christ is, quote, not under bondage in cases like that. And this is commonly understood as a second exception to the Lord's restriction against divorce found in the Gospel of Matthew. And I agree with that. Paul is not in conflict with Jesus in teaching this. The Lord was addressing the putting away of a wife by her husband, and Paul emphatically taught the same thing. But in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul addresses a different situation, one for which he had no direct teaching from the Lord uh, to guide him. But for our purposes to conclude here in the Sermon on the Mount, while the topic is the same, divorce, the context is broader and applies to all, whether married to a believer or an unbeliever, all who would seek to mold their marriage after the divine design, seeing it as a sacred union designed by God himself. In striving to uphold the sacrificial role of husband or wife, both, both may serve to advertise to the always curious world looking at us what the living gospel looks like. It looks like sacrifice, love, and the promise of never being abandoned. We're all adulterers. Everyone, every one of us is a spiritual adulterer. And aren't we glad that the Lord has not acted toward us as we deserve? That's why we're here. Father, thank you for loving us in that way. We do confess this morning our uh, spiritual adultery. Every day uh, we... Uh, go chasing after uh, other idols uh, in our lives, and yet you show such patience with us. Thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, thank you for the institution of marriage. What a wonderful thing it is. What a blessing. Uh, 
And so we pray for all the marriages that are represented here, for those that are listening, uh, that you would bless them, that you would give selflessness, that you would give the fruit of the Spirit uh, as we relate to one another and love one another and commit to one another. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.